Let's turn to Revelation chapter 18. Where are we going to? Revelation chapter 18, as we continue our series dealing with the final call, the final warning. Chapter 18 of the Revelation. And, and while you're going there, kindly write down this quotation from Testimonies for the Church, volume 1, page 121. Now, you will receive your sermon notes after this. Just get your sermon notes when we're through. But this statement is not there, so kindly note this. It says this, Father in heaven, give us understanding, we pray, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. This is talking about having faith in God. Having what, my friends? And Luke chapter 17, verse number 5, our prayer should be, Lord, increase our faith. Lord, do what? Increase our faith. It says this, I saw that if we do not feel immediate answers to our prayers, we should hold fast our faith, not allowing distrust to come in, for that will separate us from God. So what will separate us from God? Distrust. When our prayers are not immediately answered. Amen? Let's read on. If our faith wavers, we shall receive nothing from him. Our confidence in God should be strong. And when we need it most, the blessing will fall upon us like a shower of rain. Like a what, my friends? I like that. What do you say? It was represented to me like children asking a blessing of their earth parents who love them. They ask something that the parent knows will hurt them. The parent gives them the things that will be good and helpful for them in the place of that which they desire. I saw that every prayer which is sent up in faith from an honest heart will be heard of God and answered. And the one that sent up the petition will have the blessing when he needs it most. And it will often exceed his expectations. It will often do what? Exceed his expectations. Now that must bring us to a scripture, right? Go with me to Ephesians chapter 3. Hold your place in chapter 18 of the Revelation. The last sentence says, Not a prayer of a true saint is lost if sent up in faith from an honest heart. Praise God. Where are we going to, my friends? Ephesians chapter 3. And look what this statement says. Ephesians chapter 3. And let's take a look at verse number 17. Are we there, my friends? Ephesians chapter 3 and verse number 17. Read this with me together what it says. That Christ, as a matter of fact, go to verse number 16. Verse 16 says that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be what now? Talk to me. To be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That you being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints that what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that you might be filled with all the what, my friends? The fullness of God. Verse number 20, now here it is, verse 20. Now unto him, together, that is able to do what, my friends? That's the word right there to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. That's the promise. What do you say, my friends? Amen. Now write down this quotation. I'll give you a second one. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 6, page 356. Volume 6, page 356. And this is addressing how we must act and think on the Sabbath. And what's today, my friends? 
page 356, volume 6 says this. Before the Sabbath begins, before what begins? Before the Sabbath begins, the mind as well as the body should be withdrawn from worldly business. God has set his Sabbath at the end of the six working days that men may stop and consider what they have gained during the week in preparation for the pure kingdom which admits no transgressor. In other words, the way how we prepare to meet the weekly Sabbath will show us how we are preparing to enter the eternal Sabbath at the second coming of Jesus Christ. It's a litmus test. Maybe you missed that. Let's go again. It says, God has set his Sabbath at the end of the six working days that men may stop and consider what they have gained during the week, gained during the week, in preparation for the pure kingdom, which admits no transgressor. Let's move on. Watch carefully now. One more sentence. We should each Sabbath reckon with our souls to see whether the week that has ended has brought spiritual gain or spiritual loss. What does that mean to you? What must be on our minds every Sabbath? Self-examination to see what? Okay, some of you are talking. Let's make sure everyone got it. I'll repeat. We should each Sabbath reckon with our souls to see whether the week that has ended has brought spiritual gain or loss. Chapter 18 of Revelation. So what must we consider today, my friends? Talk to me. From Sunday through Friday. Did this week bring spiritual gain or spiritual loss? Because the way how we prepare for the weekly Sabbath is showing us how we are preparing for the eternal rest. The eternal Sabbath. New Jerusalem. Who wants to go over there with, with Christ? Who wants to be safe, my friends? That's why God gave us the weekly Sabbath, to prepare us for the heavenly Sabbath. Eternal rest, chapter 18, and this is a part of earth's final warning. Earth's what, my friends? And this is the third part of our series, chapter 18 of Revelation. Let's take a look at verse number one. Bible says this, and after these things I saw what? Another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. Verse 2. And he cried mightily with a strong voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils, the hold of every foul spirit, the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have done what? Drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And it goes on. Pause right there. This is earth's final warning. What is in verse number four? What call is in verse number four? Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. This is earth's final warning. If that's clear, my friends, say amen. And we discovered in verse 1 and verse 4, Earth's, Earth's last warning, it's a repetition of the first angel's message, which mentions judgment, the plagues of God, judgment, the second coming of Christ, the second death, it's judgment. Earth's last warning is also a repetition of the second angel's message. Amen. 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 All right. Earth, final warning. It's also a repetition of the third angel's message. Amen? Amen. Now, here's your quiz. What year did the first angel's message begin to be proclaimed regarding the hour of God's judgment is come? What year, my friends? 
What year? 1833. And we confirmed that last week. It's right there on your chart. And the chart is also in your sermon notes afterward. All right. What year did the second angel's message began to be preached? The summer of when? On the screen. The summer of 1844. Question now. When did the third angel's message began to be preached? We covered this last week. Come on. Let's see who went home to restudy. What year? 1846, 1847. Autumn 1846, 1847. The third angel's message began to be proclaimed. And what event was about to transpire in America in the year 1888? As you see on the chart, what event was coming in America, my friends? The enforcing of the Sunday law with persecution for dissenters, those who reject Sunday worship and hold fast to the seventh day Sabbath, 1888. And we discovered last week how many years are between 1847, third angel's message, and 1888. How many years are between there, my friends? How many years? 41 years. How many years comprise a biblical generation? How many years? 40. So God sent the everlasting gospel, the third angel's message, in its entirety in 1847. Within 40 years, God was about to bring the final crisis, and shortly thereafter, Jesus would have come. So why are we here in 2018? Why are we still here, my friends? And this is what we want to consider. Why are we still here? Now, just to make sure everyone is with me, I'm going to skip through what we have covered in the past, all right? Just to make sure everyone is with me, I'm going to quote a statement. I'm going to read a statement. Listen, read with me. Then tell me why we are still here in 2018 when the Sunday law was about to be enforced in 1888. Can someone do the math? What is put 2018 and subtract 1888? What's your total? I'm waiting on you. What's your total? Come on, math brains. What's your... Come on. Look at this statement. Great controversy, page 458. I'm going to read this statement and tell me why we are still here. And this statement is showing us a parallel, a comparison, a juxtapose with the journey of ancient Israel from Egypt to the promised land. Red Sea to the promised land. That journey typifies our journey from 1844 to the present. Why did it take Israel so long to enter into Canaan? From Egypt, from the Red Sea, why are we still here? Now I hear some of you. Let's read this. It says from top, GC 457, 458, it was not the will of God that Israel should wander 40 years. Wow, 40 years. 1847, 1888, 41 years. It was not the will of God that Israel should wander 40 years in the wilderness. God desired to lead them directly to where? The land of Canaan and establish them there, a holy, happy people. But they could not enter in because of unbelief. Hebrews 3 verse 19. Because of their backsliding and apostasy, they perished in the desert. And others were raised up to enter the promised land. In like manner. In like manner. Comparison. Juxtapose. In like manner. It was not the will of God that the coming of Christ should so long delayed should be so long delayed, and his people should remain so many years 
in this world of sin and sorrow, but unbelief separated them from God. And as they refused to do the work which he had appointed them, others were raised up to proclaim the message. In mercy to the world, Jesus delays his coming that sinners may have an opportunity to hear the warning and find in Jesus Christ a shelter before. A shelter before. Before what? Before the wrath of God is poured out. What is the wrath of God? The seven last place, which event brings the wrath of God, the mark of the beast. So tell me, why are we still here? Why are we still here? Unbelief. Unbelief regarding what? Come on, why are we still here, my friends? And what is the opposite of unbelief? Mercy, faith. Why are we still here? And then it says, go back, second red line, red words, but unbelief separated them from God as they refuse, let's read now, as they what, friends? Refuse to do the work which he had appointed them. So why are we still here? Come on, talk to me. Unbelief, we lack faith, and what else? Why are we still here? Hmm? We are not doing the work. Mercy. We are not doing the work. That's why we are still here. Go back with me. Revelation chapter 18. This is why God is saying it's time for us to receive the final warning and proclaim it. What is that work? That work is twofold. Where is the first work that must be done? In whom? Where must that first work be done? In us. Now watch the point carefully. What work is this? What did God do before he rested? C come on. Come on. What did God do before he rested? He worked. So they could not enter into God's rest because they did not so we can never enter into God's eternal rest until we allow Jesus to accomplish a work, a work in whom? In us. Question, what work did God do before he rested on the seventh day? Come on, huh? Create. I like that word. He created, right? And what says Psalm 51 and verse 10? Come on. Psalm 51 and verse 10. Create in me. Now, you don't have to have a degree to comprehend that. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. And once we allow God to create in us, to work in us, then we can begin to enter into his, into his rest. And then eternal rest. And the prayer of David, create in me a clean heart, O oh God, implied that David understood his heart, his mind, his character was not clean but filthy. So when we pray, create in me a clean heart, O God, what are we saying to God about our own heart? Our hearts are filthy in need of cleansing. And what is Christ's work in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary? Is he cleansing something? Is he working to cleanse his people? Yes. And by what means will God work to cleanse? By the word, earth's final warning. All right. I'm going to read one more statement from Great Controversy. I like this. And as I read this statement, tell me what you get from it. And the context of this statement is simply saying that the final warning should have been given to the world years ago. Let's see why it has lingered so long. Look at this. It says, GC 457, the history of ancient Israel is a striking illustration of the past experience of the Adventist body. God led his people in the Advent movement, even as he led the children of Israel from Egypt 
into great disappointment. What year was the great disappointment? Thank you. October 22nd, 1844. In the great disappointment, the Advent people, their faith was tested, as was that of the Hebrews at the Red Sea. So what year did the Adventist body come to the anti-typical Red Sea? When was the great disappointment? October 22nd, 1844. And once Israel crossed the Red Sea, what did they enter before they went into Canaan? Red Sea, something right here, then Canaan. What did they enter once they crossed the Red Sea? The wilderness. All right. When did we come to the Red Sea? Antitypically. October 22nd, 1844. I want to ask you a question. Are we in heaven yet? No. So where are we then? Mercy. So we have been wandering since 1844 to 2018. How many years? How many years between 1844 and 2018? How many years? What now? 171? Look at this. Had they still trusted to the guiding hand that had been with them in their past experience, they would have seen the salvation of God. If all who had labored unitedly in the work in 1844 had received what message? When I ask you a question, now, now friends, if you get this, I'm gonna jump for joy. What year did the third angel's message come to God's people, what year? Come on, look at your notes. 1846, 1847. Wonderful. Let's go. It says, if all who had labored unitedly in the work in 1844 had received the third angel's message, 1846, 1847, and proclaimed it in the power of the Holy Spirit, the Lord would have wrought mightily with their efforts. What are the next four words? A flood of light would have been shed upon the world. Years ago, the inhabitants of the earth would have been warned. The closing were completed and Christ would have come for the redemption of his people. Pause right there. What scripture comes to mind when you heard and read the phrase, a flood of light? A flood of light would have been shed upon the world. Revelation 18, verse 1. Let's reread that verse. Come on. Verse, verse 1. And after these things, I saw what my friends talked to me. And after these things, I saw what? Another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. It says, back to the screen, red words, second red words, a flood of light would have been shed upon the world. What is the next phrase? Blue words together, years ago. The inhabitants of the earth would have been warned. Earth's final warning. Years ago, earth's final warning should have been given to the world. So what we are talking about in this series, part three, is something that should have been done. And Jesus could have used others to do it. That's how much love and value Christ has placed upon me and upon all of you. Amen. Everyone, young and old, Amen. even you online, safe to serve, international, he wants to use us. If Christ was going to use angels alone, would we still be here? No, my friends. If the Lord would have chosen Paul, Peter, James, and John, John the Baptist, to be alive now, Elijah, would we still be here in 2018? Gone home already, my friends. It's a possibility Andrew Henriquez would not have been born. It's the 1800s now, my friends. Amen? Amen? 
Think about this. So God is looking at the weakest generation to give the strongest message. It's a loud cry. It's a strong cry. Years ago, this is why now, earth's final warning, the loud cry, the mighty cry, it comes after what great event? It comes after what great event? Talk to me now. When the mark of the beast is enforced, this is when earth's final warning swells to a loud cry. It's right here. Chapter 18 of Revelation. We just read verse 1. Verse 2, verse 3. And then in verse 4, it says what, my friends? Come out of her, my people, that you be not what? Partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her. Talk to me. Plagues. What event brings the plagues? The mark of the beast. Is the mark of the beast near? Yes. So what is due to the church and due to the world? Earth's final warning. If that's clear, my friends, say amen. amen. And notice, notice, put on your paper, put on your, put on your paper this point. Don't miss it. When the national son, the law is in force, pause. Because many folks say, you always talk about this event. Can you not preach about something else? My friends, the reason why the Bible says when this mark of the beast is in force, you make your final decision. And your decision will either cause you to be sealed, to be saved, or marked to be destroyed. A flood is coming. Get on board the ark. Fire is coming. Plagues are coming. Get on board the ark of Jesus Christ. If you saw danger coming, and your children are in the street, how would you beckon to them? We say, oh, please, Johnny. Could you kindly come out the road, Johnny? And the car is flying down that street. Oh, Johnny, Johnny, Johnny. Or would you say, Mary, never mind. No, you would warn, you would yell. Would you not yell, friends? Would you not cry aloud with a strong voice? Yes, my friend. It's the loud cry. If that's clear, my friends, say amen. Now watch the point. Don't miss the point. Chapter 14 of Revelation, verse number 9 says, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark, the same shall drink of what? The wrath of God. So when the mark of the beast is enforced, it's the close of probation. It is the judgment of the living. Put that phrase down. When the mark of the beast is enforced, the judgment of the living is now official. What do you mean, Pastor? Since October 22nd, 1844, has Christ been investigating his people? Yes. We're living in the time of investigative judgment. Judgment is a term for three phases. Investigative, and then comes the verdict phase. And after the verdict phase, then comes the sentencing execution phase. What phase have we been in since October 22nd, 1844? The investigative phase. When will Christ come to the, to the verdict phase for the living? At the Sunday law crisis. When will he come to the executive phase? When the seven last plagues begin to pour out. Then come the second death. If that's clear, my friends, say amen. Watch the statement now. Tell me if you see what we just heard in this statement. This is volume six, testimonies, page 130. Closely, watch. It says, now. What's the first sentence here, my friends, together? The first question. Now, when the great work of judging the living is about to begin, Shall we allow unsanctified ambition to take possession of the heart and lead us to neglect the education required to meet the needs in this day of peril? So what was about to begin? Come on, first phrase. What was about to begin? When the great work of judging the living, not investigative now, because the prophetess, is writing after 1844. This is volume 6, 130. Amen? Volume 6, after 1844. So when the verdict phase is about to begin, 
When will it begin? Red words. What are your red words now? In every case, the great decision is to be made whether we shall receive the mark of the beast or his image or the seal of the living God. So when does the judgment of the living, the great decision, the verdict phase, when, what event? What event, my friends? The mark of the beast. If that's clear, my friends, say amen. Do you see it? Look at this. Write this one down. Volume 5, page 81. Volume 5, page 81. From top, it says this. The time is not for distant. When the test will come to every soul. When what will come to every soul? The test will come to every soul. Then it says, the mark of the beast will be urged upon us. So what is that last test? The mark of the beast. Those who have stepped by, let's see who will fail the test and receive the mark of the beast. Those who have step by step yielded to worldly demands and conformed to worldly customs will not find it a hard matter to yield to the powers that be rather than subject themselves to derision, insult, threatened, imprisonment and death in this time what time is this now at the mark of the beast in this time the gold will be separated from the dross in the church so what event brings the great separation in a spiritual context in the church some receive the seal of god and the rest the mark of the beast what is that event my friends the mark of the beast, the son, the law. Next phrase, it says, true godliness will be clearly distinguished from the appearance and tinsel of it. Many a star that we have admired for its brilliancy will what, friends? Will then, key word, will then go out in darkness. So what event will cause this? What event will show who are just having a form of godliness and are not spiritual. Pastors, teachers who profess to be converted, but now they will receive the mark of the beast. What is this event? The Sunday law crisis. Do you see it, my friends? Next phrase, it says, watch carefully, chaff like a cloud will be borne away on the wind, let's read that next phrase, even from places where we, only, where we see only floors of rich wheat. So even in churches, whether it's conference churches or self-supporting churches, and we say, oh, we are all God's people, wheat are in here. Let's go again. Chaff like a cloud will be borne away on the wind, even from places, homes, churches, where we see only floors of rich wheat. So when will we know who are God's wheat? When? Talk to me, friends. When? So what event will show us, my friends, is when the national Sunday law is enforced. And that's why right now, we don't look for a perfect group of people in a church building. You won't find that. But to look for a perfect message. And a ministry where elders and pastors are converted. Are we together, my friends? Last phrase. All who assume the ornaments of the sanctuary. So those who profess the sanctuary message. All who assume the ornaments of the sanctuary but are not clothed with Christ's righteousness will appear in the shame of their own nakedness. When will they appear naked? When? When? And yet they profess to be Christians. When? When the national Sunday law is enforced. Is that Sunday law near, my friends? 
And that is why we are told in great controversy, page 600, and five, that when you begin to see on the screen, that when you begin to see events happening in the world, showing us a Sunday law is near, it's time for us to get ready. Why? Because Jesus is about to pronounce a verdict upon my case. Once I make my decision upon your case, Upon your wife's case, your husband's case, your children's cases. It's now no time to be fast asleep, my friends. And that's why we must emphasize this. It's time for us to receive Earth's final warning. Is that point clear, my friends? Are they calling for that Sunday law? Are they calling for it? I'm going to breeze through this. I'm going, I'm going to breeze through this. I want to share something with you. Uh, we have covered that. I won't even mention them. Look at this right here. This is from Jamaica, my homeland. No, my home is in heaven. Amen. 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 <laughs> Jesus says, I go to prepare a, but the land of my birth. Amen. February 17th, 2018, the Gleaner. This is why we must give the world Earth's final warning now. When, my friends? Because the majority of the people in the world do not know what the mark of the beast is. And many of them are saying, when the mark of the beast is enforced, don't worry, because God's people will not be on the earth at that time. Watch the point. So you can preach until thy kingdom come, as goes go the, the cliché. You could preach until thy kingdom come, till God's kingdom come. Many people won't even believe the urgency to accept the mark of the beast message. Why? Because they believe when the mark of the beast is enforced, they won't be here. Where are they going? <laughs> they might be with Elon Musk. Taking a spaceship to Mars. Foolishness. Stupidity. All right, my friends. They believe they shall be raptured out of this earth. A secret rapture. I want to ask you a question. What's going to happen in their minds when the mark of the beast is enforced and they're still here? When the plagues begin to fall and they are still here. Will they now experience a bitter disappointment? Ah, yes. oh, my friends. I wonder, will some of them, before the plagues fall, turn looking for answers? We were told, when the mark of the beast is enforced, we'll be raptured out of here. A secret rapture from earth to heaven. Will some be looking for answers? Who will they turn to? Who will they turn to? Only those who understand Earth's final warning. And we will be able to educate them and lead them in Christ's righteousness just before the plagues are poured out. But the majority, when the plagues are being poured out and there are boils and sores and the winds of strife are let loose, oh my friends, bloodshed, crime, nuclear wars, they are going to ask the question, but where is the rapture? At that time, it's going to be too late for them, my friends. So when must I and you understand this last message? When, my friends? When must we begin to give it? So may I go now to the Jamaican cleaner? February 17th, 2018. Headline, the mark of the beast, fact or fiction? Mercy. Fact or fiction? And many are saying it's fiction. Others said, well, it might be fact, but we won't be here. Everybody will be here unless you die before that time. Amen? Look at this. This pastor, Christopher Murray, of this Sunday Keeping Church, describes the mark of the beast. Christopher Murray of this church here describes the mark of the beast as what, my friends? As a seal for the followers of the Antichrist. And the false prophet, who is the spokesperson for the Antichrist. So far, is he correct? 
He, correct. The mark of the beast is connected to the Antichrist, right? Is he correct? Look at this. Next sentence. The mark of the beast will be an end time identification required by the Antichrist in order to buy or sell. Is he correct? Yes. It's connected to you can buy or sell. Next phrase. And, red words, and it will be given only to those who worship the Antichrist. Is he correct so far? Yes. The mark of the beast is linked to worship. And the sad reality is he doesn't even know it's Sunday worship. When it becomes the law of the land with persecution for those who refuse to bow. Look at this. Then he says, blue words, for the alarmists, this reign of terror. So what he's saying is, when the mark of the beast is in force, it's what time period? A reign of terror. For the alarmists, this reign of terror will not happen until God has taken his people out of the picture via the rapture. Is he, is he correct now? Error. Ignorant. But where are God's people to educate them? And let me tell you something. Jamaica, that small island, is largely a Protestant country. In other words, you have Protestants greater in number than any other denomination, even Roman Catholics. Protestants, and may I say, Seventh-day Adventists is one of maybe the largest Protestant group by number in the island of Jamaica. The very prime minister is, or was, has been, wife, has been, was, a Seventh-day Adventist. The governor general of Jamaica, a Seventh-day Adventist. May I go on? I won't. Look at this. Black word says, uh, following this event, Mark of the Beast, Murray said, is when the great tribulation will begin. Also a time when the Antichrist will be revealed. Let's read now. He will be the one who will cause persons to take the mark of the beast. As no form of business or trading, buy and selling, will be connect conducted with all this mark. Hear what he says now. So real Christians have little to worry about it. Do you see how dangerous the secret rapture theory is? It will nullify the effect, the thrust, the force of the third angel's message. So now that means as we're giving Bible studies, what topic must we make sure we cover with non seventh Adventists? That there's no, 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 before the, that there's no such thing as a secret rapture. Does it make sense, my friends? All right, back to the red words. So real Christians have little to worry about if they are living sold out lives for God as they will not be around to deal with all the horrors and tribulations that will take place during this terrible time which will see the last remnant being saved if they refuse to take the mark of the beast. What will happen, my friends, when there's no such thing as a secret rapture and they are here and the reign of terror begins Will they experience a great disappointment? So when must we give the world its final warning? It's now, my friends. All right. May I go to a second current event that shows it's now it's due to the world God's third angel's message who died this week who died this week my friends Billy Graham prominent person right and uh, we covered some of this this past Thursday I won't go back there in that great controversial study but let me say this the prominent Sunday keeping pastors are now saying that the prophecy has now been fulfilled. What prophecy? That when Billy Graham dies, that God's true church is going to come out of hiding. 
Now, that doesn't hit you yet. What does that mean, Pastor? When Billy Graham dies, the true church will come out of hiding. It's a prophecy they gave all the way back in the 1980s. It's 2018 now. Billy Graham died this week. It's time now, one, for the greatest revival to take place and the church of God to come out of hiding. Number one, what great revival is this? It's a counterfeit revival that must supersede, not supersede, that must precede the genuine revival. Now, put that on the back shelf for now. Number two, when Billy Graham dies, the true church will come out of hiding. And it, it brought my mind back to prophecy. What in the prophecy, pastor? Do you know, my friends? When the papacy, when the whom? When the papacy began to rule the world in 538 AD, when she began to persecute God's true commandment keeping people, when the papacy was in public, where was the commandment keeping people of God? They went into hiding. So when the papacy came to the forefront and began to persecute, God's faithful people, commandment keeping people, went where? Into hiding, into the wilderness. Make sense now? What happened in 1798? Papacy over here, my left hand, God's people, my right hand. What happened in 1798 for the papacy? She received her deadly wound and went into the wilderness. And as she, the papacy, went into the wilderness, could no longer persecute God's people publicly. What happened to God's true church now? They came into prominence. Publicly, they could worship God. And what happened in America in 1776? Come on now. Freedom of worship. Do you see it now? So God's people could worship God freely and publicly. But my friends, what happened in 1798 again? The papacy received her deadly wound. She went into where? Hide or into the wilderness. But that deadly wound will one day be what? And once it is healed, what happens to God's commanding, keeping people now? Back into the wilderness, into hiding. Does that make sense to you, my friend? So when now Benny Hinn is saying, we prophesied as a church that once Billy Graham dies, the church will come out of hiding. What church is this? It is the ecumenical church. Benny Hinn. What's the other one who speaks in tongues and said 2018, the year of fire? What's his name? <laughs> Kenneth Copeland and the rest. They are all one with the papacy now. So which church is going to come out of hiding and bring a great revival? It's the ecumenical church. What happened October 31st, 2016 through October 31st, 2017? The death of Protestantism. The papacy and apostate Protestants are now one. So what's coming for us, my friends? Here it is now. Billy Graham dropped dead. Here it is now. They claim he's in heaven. Won't spend much time there. Let's Here it is. Billy Graham's death. Billy Graham's death marks what, my friends? Beginning of what? It's the counterfeit revival. And then here it is. Benny Hinn. Char this is Charisma News. February 21st, 2018. Headline. The church will come out of where? Hiding when Billy Graham dies. Go with me. Revelation chapter 11. Where are we going to, my friends? Go there with me. Chapter 11 of the Revelation. Look with me. Verse number 2. Are we there in verse 2? Now, this is a papacy in verse 2. And verse number 3 now says, I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy. A thousand two hundred and three score prophetic days clothed in what? In sackcloth. Look with me. Chapter 17 now of Revelation. Where are we going to, my friends? 
chapter 17 of Revelation. And look with me at verse number 2. This is a papacy in verse 2. And what is in verse 3? So he carried me away in the spirit into where? The wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon what? The scarlet colored beast. Full of names of what? Blasphemy. So where is the papacy since 1798? In the wilderness. But is that deadly wound being healed? Is she coming out? Which church will heal the wound of the papacy? Which entity will heal the wound of the papacy? Apostate Protestant America. Is it not being healed, my friends? And once the church comes out of hiding, the ecumenical church, the papacy, and apostate Protestants, what will happen to God's people once that mark of the beast is enforced? Where do we go, my friends? We find ourselves in the wilderness, not only spiritually, but literally, country living. Oh, beloved. When Billy Graham dies, the church is coming out of hiding. The ecumenical church. Papacy and apostate Protestants. When they are in public, God's people go to the wilderness. Are we seeing this, my friends? So where must we now be looking to go? Where must we now be? In the wilderness, literally. Rural districts. Country living. Write down Adventist home, page 137. Adventist home, page 141. Adventist home, 137. Adventist home, 141. It's now, my friends. It's late. These are signs. And then, today's Sabbath, look what's happening in Rome. Look at that. The ecumenical church. Once Billy Graham dies, the church goes public now. False revival. Pass this. All right, look at this now. Let me run past it. Look at this. Watch this carefully. February 23rd, 2018. Watch this. Headline, headline says what? The most famous persecution site in the world will bleed red tomorrow. Today. Remembering whom? Martyrs. This is the Roman Colosseum. What happened in that Colosseum years ago? It's right there. The martyrs of Jesus were butchered. Go to chapter 17 of Revelation. The martyrs were butchered. And this is one reason we must leave sports alone. Leave competitive sports alone. Now the watching no support. And do you know why, my friends? It was a sport to bring the Christians in the arenas and have wild animals eat them alive because God's people refused to give up the faith of Jesus Christ. It's only modernized now. And notice, is, are they saying the true church is coming out of hiding? Billy Graham dies now. We are coming out of hiding. What will happen to God's people? They go where? Into the wilderness. Obscurity. And now on the heels of this, they are saying, remember what happened in the Roman Colosseums. Who was butchering the martyrs? It was the Roman Empire. But with church continued martyrdom after the Roman emperors came off the scene. Which church? The Roman Catholic Church. In other words, they are telling us, remember the past. Because history will be what? Repeated, my friends. Watch this. Do you know who is leading this out in this project? Roman Catholics. Watch this. According to a recent report, by Christian charity open doors, how many millions? 215 million Christians 
experience high, very high, or extreme persecution for following Jesus. Watch carefully now. Saturday's event today is organized by what group? By the Roman Catholic Church. And has the backing of the president of the European Parliament and the EU's special envoy on religious freedom. Who is that? Jan Figel. Who is Jan Figel? Jan Figel. He's, he went to Georgetown University. Jesuit educated. Which group was established by the papacy to destroy the Protestant Reformation? The Jesuits, my friends. La come on. Last phrase, alongside the Colosseum, where some Christians were executed for refusing to worship Roman gods. So why were they killed? They refused to worship falsely. And what is the chief god of the Romans? It's all in their pictures, artifacts, sculptures, their paintings. It's the sun from which we get what? Sunday. So what's coming for us, my friends? Can we not see what's coming? And what do we find in verse 6 of chapter 17? Of the revelation, and I saw the woman, what, my friends, drunken. With the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, will this be fulfilled again? My friends, it's time to get ready. Do you know right now, the monetary system is now being put in place. You, you can't buy yourself. I was not going to share this, but I must. Beloved, this is not the news hour roundup. It is the prophetic signs, events, roundup, based on prophecy. Look what's coming. Even in Sweden, watch this. Headline says, black horse, pale horse coming. Won't stop there. February 19th, Bloomberg. Headline says what? No cash signs. Everywhere. Has, has Sweden worried? It's gone too far? Watch carefully. No cash accepted signs are becoming. Beloved, when I drop this, you're going to see where we are. Because some of you are now saying, Pastor, we know this already. Cashless society, we know this already. Watch this. No cash accepted signs are becoming an increasingly common sight in shops and eateries across Sweden. Across where? Don't forget that across Sweden as payments go digital and mobile. Let's read this sentence together, red words. Sweden is widely regarded as the most cashless society on the planet. It's the most what? It's the most cashless society on the planet. That's Sweden, listen now. Most of the country's bank branches have stopped Handling cash banks. Pause. Before I deal with Sweden, pause right there. I was driving in town one day, and the thought of having a cashless society became so much more real to me. Who do we see at many uh, intersections, especially in the cities, urban areas, with a pot and a sign? Homeless. Poor, paupers, those in poverty, and what are they begging? Money. Can you imagine a day when the homeless people have a credit card receiver machine? Where are they going to get money to pay for the internet to be wireless? If it's cashless, what will happen to those who beg money on the streets? And you have no more cash. Are the poor going to walk around with a device saying, money please, just swipe your card right here. I take Visa, MasterCard, American Express, huh? debit or credit. Can you imagine, my friends? And I also thought about car porters. 
canvassers. Those who uh, uh, sell truth through literature. Now, they deal with cash. But now we have canvassers who have their smartphones and they take cards, right? But what's going to happen when we can't be on that system, but your canvassing must still go forward? Just imagine what's coming. Let's read on. It says this. Watch carefully. When will this come into, into play? Blue words, bottom. A final proposal is not expected until late next year. But the idea is that the E chrono, chrono would work as a complement to cash, not replace it completely. Back to Sweden. Back to Sweden. I want to ask you a question. Which country are they saying is widely regarded as the most cashless society on the planet? Who? And when they go cashless, can they leave you penniless? Can they leave, lead you, leave you penniless, my friends? Can they? Look at this. With a flick of a switch, they could leave you how? All right. Sweden go, going cashless. I want to ask you a question. In which country did the Pope go to to begin the death of Protestantism? There it is. Which country did the Pope travel to October 31st? 2016, to begin the year-long celebration of the death of Protestantism, October 31st, 2017. Which country was that, my friends? Lond. Lond. Sweden. That's where he went, my friends. So Sweden was ground zero for the death of Protestantism. And now Sweden is ground zero for a cashless society. Do you see a correlation? Yeah. What do you see? I'm waiting. Talk to me. What do you see? Because sometimes it flies over your head. What do you see? What's the connection there? You won't be able to what now? Are we nearing home, my friends? What another correlation? Who is that on the screen? Picture. Tim Cook and the Pope. And once they met together, what has Tim Cook said next recently? We are going to kill cash. The Pope went to Sweden. Sweden, cashless. In Protestantism. Met with Tim Cook. I will join with you, Mr. Pope. I will kill cash, he said. And now, how many of you have a WhatsApp device? Or a WhatsApp app? Anybody, my friends? Do you know even WhatsApp is a part of this cashless society? Which is going to be a part to restrict your liberties? But pastor, it's my only device to make long distance calls. Headline. I have been sitting on this one for a few weeks now. It's time. MSN. WhatsApp starts what, my friends? Come on. WhatsApp starts digital payment test in what country? So now, in India. So what we must do is to go to India and see what the people in India are saying about a cashless society. Because all these companies, they have India as their testing ground. India is where they do their beta testing. Let's go now. India, why India? They began early in 2017. Why India? Look at this, my friends. India is building a what? A biometric database for 1.3 billion people and enrollment is mandatory. I wonder why. Watch this. Fingerprints. Then it says blue words. Nearly. How many, my friends? Nine out of ten Indians have registered. Red words. It says, if she did not get a number with the biometric system in India, she worried that she would not be able to eat. India is the beta testing ground. Then it says, watch carefully. I won't read all of this. All right. Blue words at the bottom. 
This month, lawyers opposing ADAR argued before the Supreme Court in India that the government could not force Indians to share their biometric data. The Attorney General countered that what might come out that Indians had no constitutional right to privacy and could not claim an absolute right over their bodies. Let's go back. Headline says what now, my friends? Headline, WhatsApp starts digital payment test. It's biometric test in India. And what's coming to America, my friends? What's coming to America? Go back with me. Chapter 18 of the Revelation. So my, when must we bring this gospel to the world? When must we warn the people the close of probation is near? It's now. It's now. My friend, how do you feel right now? How do you feel right now? Do you not see a need to get ready spiritually and physically? Do you not see a need, my friends? If these things did not give you any urgency in your soul, something is wrong with you spiritually. Yes. You must say, dear God, help me to get my home in order. Amen. Watch. Do you know that some of the very people who support and call and vote for the son of the law would do so ignorantly? And many of them will be saved. Chapter 18, go there with me. Chapter 18 of the Revelation. Look at verse 4. What it says here, my friends, together. What is the call? Together, what it says. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, what, my friends? Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. So what is the call in the final warning? Come out of her, my people. Wait a minute. Where were they previously? In Babylon. They called for the Sunday law. And God now says, even though you voted for the Sunday law to be enforced, it's now enforced. This is your last call. You know now you have done that which was wrong. Surrender. Honor my Sabbath. Let's prove that. Hold your place in chapter 18. Go to Acts 2 with me. Where are we going to, my friends? I want to ask you a question. Did everybody who cried for Barabbas and said, crucify Jesus, did all of them reject the, the apostles' message after Pentecost? Did some receive the message after Pentecost, even though they cried, give us Barabbas away with Jesus? All right. So what is God showing us? When the loud cry is given, it is given to people who also had supported the son of the law. If that's clear, my friend, say amen. Go to Acts 2. Look, and I'm going to show you something. Acts 2, are we there, my friends? Look with me at verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom you have what? Crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, what, my friends? Repent and be baptized, every one of you. Did they repent? Now, was there a call once they realized they had called for Christ's death? Look at verse number 40. Verse 40 now, verse 40. Verse 40, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Christ Jesus, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Verse 40, and with many other words, did he testify and exhort, saying, what, my friends? Save yourselves from this untoward generation. I want to ask you a question. 
What does that mean based on chapter 18 and verse 4 of the Revelation? Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Come on. It means what? Come out. Do you see it? Come out. Go to verse 41. Then they that gladly receive his word were baptized. And the same day they were added unto them. How many souls? 3,000 souls. Go to Acts chapter 3. Which shows when the son of the law is enforced, many who called for it. They would do so because they were deceived. At that time, we have to give them the final. Acts chapter 3. Go to verse 14. Verse 14 says, I'm going to skip through and scan through the scripture. Acts chapter 3, verse 14. But you have denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you. And kill whom? Verse 15. And killed the prince of life. Verse 17. And now, brethren, I what or I know that through what? Ignorance you did it. As did also your rulers. Verse 19. Repent you therefore and be what now? Converted that your sins may be blotted out. When what? The times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. So will many be called to come out from Babylon. When the son of the law is enforced, even though they were the ones who voted for the son of the law. Give us Barabbas. Crucify Jesus. Barabbas, son of God. Bar, son. Abba, father. Barabbas, the counterfeit son of God. Jesus, the true son of God. False worship, true worship. Will they come out? Will they also receive the latter rain? Will they repent and receive the latter rain, the refreshing? Yes, they will. Now, my friends, how many of you have children? Let's leave those in the world now. Many of them will come out, but the majority will receive the seven last plagues. They will not heed the last warning. Let's come to us now. How many of you have grown children? You rear them in the faith. But right now, February 24th, 2018, they have left the faith. Will there be an opportunity for them to come home? Will there be an opportunity? I'm going to share with you a statement. I want you to write this reference down. Go back home and get the book, print Print out the actual page with the quotation. Put that page in your Bible. And wherever your Bible go, let that statement be there. And ask God for choice words to reach your loved ones who have left true Seventh-day Adventism. They have left present truth. And claim this promise. And be careful how you speak to them. Because many times they are like the prodigal. When the prodigal left the house, the father did not run behind him. But the lost sheep, he went behind the lost sheep. The lost coin, they had to sweep and put light to find the coin. But not the prodigal. And many of us, we have husbands who are prodigals. Wives, prodigal. Children, prodigal. Siblings, brothers, sisters, prodigal. Left the faith. Left the faith. This statement, hold on to it. Ready for it? Watch this. Volume, not volume one, volume six, page 400. It's really page 401. Listen what this says. Those who have had great light and precious privileges but have not improved them will under one pretext or another go out from us. Not having received the love of the truth, they will be taken in the delusions of the enemy. 
They will give heed to what, my friends, seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And what will they do? They will depart from the faith. Listen now. But on the other hand, when the storm of persecution really breaks upon us, what is that storm of persecution that will break upon us? It's the Sunday law crisis, GC 608, as the storm approaches. But on the other hand, when the storm of persecution really breaks upon us, the Sunday law time period, what happens next? Let's read. The true sheep will hear the true shepherd's voice. Watch. Self-denying efforts will be put forth to save the lost. And many who have strayed from the fold, and many who have strayed from the fold will come back to follow. Will come back to follow. The great shepherd. Amen. 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 Now we can say yes. But what is the context of that statement? Red words. Red words. But on the other hand, when the storm of persecution breaks upon us, self-denying efforts will be put forth to save the lost and many who have strayed from the fold. We'll come back to follow the great shepherd. What a statement. What a statement. And if some of you don't have a loved one who have strayed, this means nothing to you. Nothing to you. But if you have a loved one who have strayed from present truth, this must mean the whole world to you, my friend. That's why in John 10, verse 16, Jesus says, are the sheep I have. They are not of this fold, or they have left the fold. Them also must I bring. How would he bring them? They will hear my voice, and they will follow me. When will they hear his voice? The final shepherd's voice. When? When the great storm of persecution breaks upon us, many who have strayed from the fold, they are coming back. They are coming back. Now, now, if you are now hearing this message, if you're local, if you're online, if you're now hearing this message, don't make this mistake. Oh, so that means I can come back then. You know where I'm going now. I can come back then. When the son the law is enforced, I can come back then. I can claim volume six, page 401. If you leave now, you will not return. Do you know why? In the face of God's word, you are committing the unpardonable sin. This is the sin of presumption at this late, again, late hour, you go nowhere. David says, I will dwell in the house of the Lord. How long? Forever, my friends. Will they come back? How many of you love this statement now? Amen. Then it says, last phrase, then it says, watch carefully at the shepherd. The people of God will draw together and present to the enemy a united front. Amen. So what event will solve all this conference or non-conference? Conference, self-supporting churches. Um, this doctrine that, what event will solve all that stuff? What event? That's under law. And it's very near. Praise God. Just wait. It says, last phrase, watch carefully, last phrase, then will what? Talk to me. Blue words, then will the message of the third angel swell to a loud cry, and the whole earth will what, my friends, be lightened with the glory of God. How many of you have a husband who has strayed, 
a wife. She has strayed. Children, strayed. Siblings, strayed. Here is a promise to claim. Hold on to it, my friends. And if, if there's hope, they will come back in. But the sad reality is some may die before they get that chance. Die before they get that chance. This is why this message means so much to me, my friends. So much. Not only those on the outside coming in, but even those who were once Seventh-day Adventists. You can't stray from something you were never a part of. Blue words, self-denying efforts will be put forth to save the lost and many who have strayed from the fold. So where were they previously? Where were they previously? In the fold. And he has one fold. Seventh-day Adventism, one fold. They will come back in. Will you claim it, my friends? Now, now, you know what? Let me see if this did not fall on deaf ears. How many of you can relate to this statement right here? How many of you appreciate this statement? Raise your hand right now. My two hands are up. This I appreciate. Hands down. Even those online, do you appreciate this statement? For the next few moments, let's see how we can get the spirit of the loud cry to give the final call. Go to chapter 18 again. Verse number one. What will come down from heaven? An angel will come down from heaven having what power? Great power. And the earth will be lightened with God's glory. Friends, I'm done. I'm not giving you anything more. Just follow me right here. Must that angel come down to give us power? And light has to come down. Hear me. And the angel must come down because to reach your husband who has strayed, who have strayed, your children who have strayed, to reach them, you're going to need more than mere arguments. That's my point. You are going to need more than just a Bible study to reach them. You must be so filled with the Spirit of God that when you speak, they hear the voice of the true shepherd. Amen. Revelation 22, verse 17. For the spirit and the bride say, come. Come out of her, my people. I get excited. For the spirit and the bride say, come. Who is talking? The spirit and the bride. And let him that hear Turn around and say what? Come! That means when they hear my voice, whose voice must they hear? The spirit and the bride speaking. And that bride in the primary sense is New Jerusalem. I mean, as if God is giving us an, an, uh, uh, a figure of speech. How can a building speak? But New Jerusalem is saying, come, come out of her, my people. We must be so connected that when we speak to our husband, we speak to our children, we speak to our wife, they hear not our, our voice, but the Spirit of God saying, it's time to come home to Jesus. It's time. It's time to come home. It's time. The songwriter says, I've wandered far away from God. But what? But now I'm coming home. When must we come home, friends? No. Must we wait until that Sunday law? No. Come home. The paths of sin too long I've trod. Now I'm coming. And as this song is sung, I want everyone to reflect upon these words. It's time, my friends. The spirit and the bride say, come. Let him that heareth say, come. And whosoever will, let him take 
of the water of life freely. Come, my friends, come, come. I've wandered far away from God. But when? Now I'm coming home. Let's take that song. First dance. Friends, that second stanza says, I've wasted many precious years. Is that you, my friends? But now I'm coming home. I now repent with bitter tears. Lord, I'm coming home. How much longer are you going to wait? It's time to give Jesus your all. Let's get that stanza. Many. Stanza says, that third, that third stanza says, Lord, I'm tired of sinning. I'm tired of sinning and string, Lord. Now I'm coming home. I now trust your love and believe thy word. I trust your love. You would not turn me away empty. I now trust your love. I believe thy love. I trust thy word. Lord, I'm coming home. Friends, the final warning says, come out of her, my people. Come on home. Let's take that third stanza. I'm tired of sin yes. and straying, Lord. Lord, I'm coming home. Now. Coming home, coming home. Let's sing it out. Let's sing it out.
Simon, if you believe God, God loves you. Hands down. Will you come home right now? Amen. Take these last words as you leave. I saw some with strong faith and agonizing cries pleading with God. Tell me whose experience is this? Their countenances were pale and marked with deep anxiety, expressive of their internal struggle. Are you having any struggle internally, my friends? Firmness and great earnestness was expressed in their countenances. Large drops of perspiration fell from their foreheads. Now and then, now and then, their faces would light up with the marks of God's approbation. And again, the same solemn, earnest, anxious look would settle upon them. Whose experience must we have, my friends? This is Christ's experience in Gethsemane. Did an angel come down to strengthen him? Friends, hear me. When you go through these last days, do not expect that every day it's going to be sunny. No. There are going to be days where you only see dark, angry clouds. But remember Christ on the cross. When dark clouds were around him, he still said, Father, into your hands I commend, I give my life. Evil angels crowded around, pressing what, my friends? Darkness upon them to shut out Jesus from their view, that their eyes might be drawn to the darkness that surrounded them. And thus they be led to distrust God and murmur against him. Their only safety was in keeping their eyes, we are my friends, directed upwards as the praying ones continued their earnest cries, their earnest cries, at times, at what my friends? At times, not all the time, at times, a ray of light from Jesus came to them to encourage their hearts and light up their countenances. So as we go through trials, must we expect that ray of light to come? To encourage us, oh friends, to light up our countenances that when our loved ones see us, they don't see a frown because we're carrying the weight and the burdens of life. Say, so dear God, there's darkness around me now, but I plead for the ray of light. Oh, some I saw did not participate in this work of agonizing and pleading. They seemed, how friends, indifferent and careless. And if you remember Christ in Gethsemane, he prayed, Father, not my will, but, O oh, Father, thy will be done. And when the angel came down the third time and strengthened him, the Bible says, he being in agony, prayed more earnestly. So the experience you received today it's not good for tomorrow. Tomorrow you need another experience. But some seem indifferent, oh, and careless. They were not resisting the darkness around them. And it shut them in like a thick cloud. So what must we do to get those dark clouds away from us, friends? Have the Gethsemane experience 
not my will, dear God, but thy will be done. The angels of God left these and went to the aid of the earnest praying ones. But his angels left those who made no effort to help themselves, and I lost sight of them. I lost sight of them. So my friends, were they passed by? Why were they passed by? Why were they passed by? Why did God's angels leave those and went to help those who were praying? Why were they passed by? Talk to me, my friends. Why? They were indifferent. They were careless. Indifferent and careless to what? What's the context? They were not having that strong, consistent, earnest prayer life. You can talk whatever you want to talk about. You can even come to church on the Sabbath. But if you're not having the Gethsemane experience, you will be passed by. Pass me not, O oh gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling. What is the call, my friends? Let's take that. Savior, oh Savior. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not. Do That, that second stanza says, Let me act thy throne of mercy. Find a sweet relief. Kneeling there in deep contrition. Help thou my unbelief, my friends. And this is the answer for our healing. Do you believe? I can give you victory. Do you believe I can heal you? Lord, I believe, the man said. Help thou my unbelief. Let's take that. Let me at thy throne of mercy find a sweet relief. Kneeling there in deep contrition. Will you surrender, my friends? Help thou my unbelief. Help my unbelief. Savior, oh Savior. Savior, oh yes. Savior, hear my humble cry. Why? This says, I was shown those whom I had before seen, weeping and praying in agony of spirit. The company of guardian angels around them had been doubled. Oh, friends, what will those people receive? Double power. May I ask you a question, friends? Oh, listen to me. What did Elisha 
asked for before Elijah was taken up? Give me a double portion of thy spirit. Listen. And Elijah said to Elisha, if you see me go, you will receive what you ask for. Oh, if you see me go, Elijah. That means Elisha had to remain. How? Watchful. Vigilant. Watchful. What did Jesus say to the apostles, disciples in Gethsemane to receive power for the crisis? Watch and pray. If they were watching and praying, what would they, what would they have received as Christ received? Oh, my friends. Oh, my friends. Oh, my friends. Are you a Christian or you just plain church? Watch. If you see me go, you will get that double portion. Get so many. Christ received it. The disciples were asleep. Oh, may we have a stronger, personal, consistent prayer life. You'll be stronger to meet life's trials. It had, I heard them, who were clothed with the armor, speak for the truth with great power. It had effect. How effective were their messages after having this experience? Many had been bound. Some wives bound by their husbands. Don't go to that church, some say. Don't go to those Bible studies. Come over here. Don't accept the Sabbath. Stay with me, my Sunday keeping church. And all the preaching we are doing is not going to have the effect until we're in Gethsemane. It had effect. Many have been bound, some wise by their husbands, some children by their parents, the honest who had been prevented from hearing the truth, now eagerly laid hold upon it. All fear of their relatives was gone, and the truth alone was exalted to them. They had been hungering and thirsting for truth. It was dearer and more precious than life. I asked, what had made this great change? An angel answered, it is the latter rain, the refreshing from the presence of the Lord, the loud cry, the final cry of the third angel. Before I get that fourth stanza, now when you stand for God and husband and wife forsake you on this earth, You'll have to walk alone. Husbands have separated from wives. Wives are cut off husbands. Because one wants to live for God. And the other is proud and selfish and self-centered. Wanting to live in the world. And many times we're going to feel lonely. Remember this song. Nations are going to hate us. You may be going through a serious divorce right now. Friends may forsake you because you stand for present truth. Remember these words. I won't even quote them. Fourth stanza. Fourth stanza. Father. The spring of all my comfort. More than life. More than life for whom have I on earth beside whom have I in heaven whom in heaven but thee oh 
Savior, Savior. Comprehend what you heard today, friends? Kneel with me at this time. Father in heaven, on bended knees, we surrender all to you. Save us. On bended knees, we are saying that we recommit our lives to you. Save us is our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.